this is the video. This is the mental health video. And I have started and restarted and re-recorded and then erased and restarted. I don't even know how many times. Um, I'm not entirely sure how I really want to approach this. Um, I don't really know where to start. I, it's a, it's a weird subject. It's a sensitive subject. And, uh, I suppose the best place to start is the beginning, but I don't really know where the beginning was for me. Um, a lot of my earlier memories were told to me. They're not really something that I remember. So I'm not really sure how accurate they are. Um, but I've been told that I was always a nervous child. I've always been a little bit of a planner and uh, I need to have everything, you know, laid out and, and uh, planned and, you know, written in my planner and scheduled and all these things. So it was, um, that's kind of always been there throughout my entire life. I do remember the first time I ever felt depressed was when my brother visited my father in North Carolina as a child and he was gone for almost two months, I think. It was the majority of the summer um, and we were about four or five at the time and it was the worst ever time for me. I, I missed him so much and I was so sad. I wouldn't watch my shows, I wouldn't eat my favorite foods, I wouldn't get out of bed, I was insolent, I was just, I was not a pleasant person to be around and I was missing my brother. We were a, you know, two cogs of one machine, it was literally him and I forever. Um, I couldn't function without him and it was awful, which probably was the beginning of my codependency problems, if I'm honest with myself and with you, of course. Um, but that's a whole nother, whole nother category. And I, uh, I remember, you know, getting picked up in school and not wanting so bad to be popular and I couldn't be, and I wasn't quite smart enough to be part of the smart kids, but I was too smart to be with the other not smart kids. I, I didn't really fit in anywhere and I was a band geek and you know really good at my foreign languages and I loved science. I was so good at it and uh, I could write and I, I wrote poetry but I could draw and I could you know I could create art but I wasn't weird enough. You know I wasn't I just wasn't wasn't really quite enough of anything to really fall anywhere. Uh, which was detrimental to like not belong to anything. I was a cheerleader. I never felt like I was like part of a thing. Um, I was always a little bit bigger than everyone else. I was never big, but for a cheerleader, I was big. And I always just felt weird and a little bit out of place and, and, and not real. And I felt like everybody could see that. I felt like there was a big sign on my back that just said this, this bitch is pretending like don't don't give her a time of day and I really did feel that way um, all the way through college and then my pregnancy happened with my son and everything changed so um, during my pregnancy it was discovered that I had some fibroid tumors uh, those of you who don't know it's a fibrous tumor that lives in your uterus where the baby um, is intubated and I I experienced some difficulty with my menstrual cycles uh, my whole life and uh, it was attributed to that and then um, when they went in for my hysterectomy we discovered that I also had polycystic ovarian syndrome is where we landed but I ended up with um, I had a number of cysts on one of my ovaries so bad that it just wasn't even savable um, and the other one was, it was, as they are cyclic, so it would, it would form and then it would burst and then it would happen on the other side and then it would burst. And those of you who suffered from any ovarian cysts, you know that they are excruciatingly painful until they burst and then there, there is no more pain after that, but it, it it's brutal. And it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between that and you know menstrual pain uh, until you've had a hysterectomy and you have no uterus and it's all ovarian pain and it all feels the same um, 
I struggled a lot with depression after that hysterectomy because I did not feel very womanly. I was uh, a 25, I think, and uh, the choice to have more children was taken from me, and I had a really hard time seeing the silver lining in that. I am now able to understand that I have a wonderful child and I was given that opportunity to have a wonderful child and it's okay that I've not had any more. Um, I get the ability to love other people's children. My brother's children are absolutely my pride and joy. Those kids are just as good as my own. Like They feel exactly the same way to me. I have the ability to love other people's children and some people can't do that. So. I had to switch, you know, my negative feelings about that over to this wonderful gift that I was given was to love all these other babies. And um, I do still struggle sometimes with feeling um, inadequate that I can't, that I'm not a real full woman. And I think that a lot of people who experience um, hysterectomies in that way uh, feel that. I don't think that that's abnormal but it definitely feeds this, this depression monster that lives um, in there. I've uh, seen a number of therapists and I've been on a num number of medication regimens that have gone off and started and stopped and restarted. And uh, I, was, I unfortunately was never really able to find a combination that worked for me for medication. Um, where I am medication free now in terms of depression obviously I'm not completely medication free or else what would we be doing here um, I don't take anything for my depression or anxiety and I do my best to work through them as best I can and uh, I am not a professional and I make many mistakes and sometimes they are big mistakes um, sometimes there are days that I can't function and uh, I am thankful that I have the partner that I have because he is so good at just pulling me out of that and, and turning everything around and showing me the, the good things and the light in my life and even when I don't want to see them uh, he will just very patiently okay but <laughs> okay but and as angry as it makes me in the moment I, I am disgustingly grateful for that because I don't think that I would be as successful in anything that I am without him. And it's pretty pretty profound that someone like me could find someone like him. And I think that that someone like me comment is a, an absolute window pane into the chaos that's in my head consistently. I'm always feeling like I could be better. I not good enough at XYZ or that I can improve in XYZ and that creates a perfectionist OCD problem and um, so my official diagnoses are major depressive order disorder panic disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder so um, my OCD consists of safety so I am consistently checking um, seat belts. I'm consistently checking, you know, that the door is locked, that I've set my alarms, that, you know, and, and I cannot, I cannot move to the next thing without doing that thing. Um, I count stairs and I've, I've kind of moved away from the counting stairs, but there was a point in my life where I knew exactly how many steps to get to whatever was around me, you know, and, and it started bleeding into my work life and it got a little out of control. Um, I do not feel that it's gotten worse with this medicine. I do not feel any different in terms of OCD. I do not feel any different in terms of anxiety. I think my normal stressors are uh, the same. It doesn't relieve them and it doesn't make them worse. Um, I do notice a lot more fluctuation with the depressive episodes. Um, I've had two since I started, uh, which is a little bit more frequent than I usually do, but I'm also fighting this great big thing where I used food as a pacifier instead of feeling 
my feelings and the food's gone away so I anticipated a little increase with this um, and it's hard it is so much harder than I thought to like realize that okay you feel like shit you can eat now but wait you can't eat and like how to deal with that like I was I didn't have a plan in place for that which is not characteristic of me um, and I'm kind of floundering a little bit which causes a little bit of depression I don't really know how to handle um, what to do if I don't eat and I'm trying to treat it a lot like when I quit smoking cigarettes you just find a different routine but I mean eating is such a thing that like everybody does like if you quit smoking you can hang out with non-smokers and you don't feel tempted I can't hang out with non-eaters that doesn't exist like food is life like you, you, it's fuel for your body every human being every living thing on the earth needs to eat it's not their fault I can't control myself and I do feel that way sometimes that it's more of a I can't control myself than it is you know anything else um, but I really wanted to talk about you know the mental strain of food and food addiction and you know pre-existing conditions I've, I have felt in so many ways my depression is related to my food and I had thought for so many years that I was depressed because I was fat and it has taken me nine days to figure out that I was fat because I was depressed and until the depression is is, is attended to and fixed and you know brought to a head and drained I will always have problems with food and what I'm trying to do with this medicine is learn the portions and the food choices without the uh, without the option of binging so that I can work on the emotional part I can work on the trauma I can work on all the the crap that's floating around in my head and I don't have to do them both at the same time so that by the time I'm done with this medicine it's second nature to me to only eat one piece of chicken, not 12. To only eat a couple of scoops of rice and not the entire pot. I think that my inner voice has said to me on so many occasions, shh, 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 six slices of pizza is fine. If nobody sees you eat the whole bag of Cheetos, nobody's gonna know. You're gonna be all right. And I, I need to learn to turn that around. And I think that, that that's part of the depression. I think they're all linked. I think it's all the same, the same source. And we're working diligently to find out what that source is. That being said, I want to close this out with um, some little pearls of wisdom. If you are suffering from some kind of depression or what you believe to be depression or anxiety or just not feeling right, Please talk to somebody, if it's a friend, a brother, a doctor, your cashier at the store, it doesn't matter who you talk to, but get it out, talk to somebody. And don't be afraid to talk about the feelings that you're feeling. I know everybody, they're uncomfortable, and everybody feels weird about saying, yeah, I'm depressed. It's this big, giant spotlight on you, and everybody, you know, can... Everybody walks around on tiptoes around you. That's that's not it. I'm, I'm still a normal person. I still hold a job. I'm still a mother. I'm still a partner. I'm still a sister. I'm still an aunt. And I'm a really good one, I think. And uh, it's okay that I sometimes am sad. I'm learning to work through that. And I think that being able to talk about it really helps with that. And I think that... Uh, being open about it and people knowing that I'm not always going to be, you know, like I think, I think that that, that's a realness that's rare, especially in our generation. So don't be afraid of yourself and get your shit out there, man. Get your shit out there and tell everybody how you're feeling and what's going on in your life. Somebody might have the answers. Somebody might have the, the little thing that fixes the thing for you. Who knows? I certainly did not think that this was going to be my life. I honestly thought that I was going to 
die young and large and alone and that's not the case now and I had no idea and it wasn't until I opened my mouth and I said something to someone that I landed here share your thoughts people share your love thanks for listening